We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is David Skarika, publisher and founder of Stock Chart of the Day and formerly Addicted to Profits.net. David, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So we were going to talk about a possible you know, threat to the markets, the market stability that the Fed counts on so much. And you know, it seems like there are these really countervailing forces at odds here, which makes the Fed's path a lot harder. But you pointed out something to me the other day that we're going to discuss today as a big risk in the markets as you see it. Yeah, If you remember in our last interview, so I, if I can just do a quick recap here, yep. I talked about that I thought this was more of a normal Fed loosening cycle. And I talked about equities probably would hold up and gold should begin to do well as we get into that. So we have seen gold prices break out, even though we have not even seen the start or we're, as of now, it doesn't look like we're even near the start of the Fed loosening. Mm -hmm. And I think there's other reasons for that, which is we'll get into it, which is going to be what we're going to talk about. You're talking about this risk factor. And we have seen equities hold up as well. But let's just get past the equity market right now before we get into the risks. The issue I'm having right now between when I was just on a few months, I know it was just a few months ago, is the amount of frothiness you know we're seeing coming into the market. For example, a few months ago, that Bitcoin ETF had just been launched. And now, you know, being a contrarian, you know, now that I'm seeing, I, you know, I get these, these uh, updates, you know, from apps or whatever on my phone, I, you know, and I see like, now everyone's calling for Bitcoin to go to 150,000 or 300,000 and get the Bitcoin ETF. And, you know, you got those altcoins moving and that's always kind of a sign, you know, if you look at 2021 or 2017, you're getting into this frothiness in the market. And then, you know, obviously, you have stocks like NVIDIA and Meta and all these things, Magnificent Seven, as they call them, or it's more like the Magnificent Five now because Apple and Tesla have not done well this year. Mm -hmm. But again, they're getting frothy. And I think there's a stat that shows the top 10 largest stocks as a percentage of total market cap is now back where it was, you know, in 2000 and 1929 at the height of these bubbles. And like, I actually saw a tweet that showed that the I guess that they're having an AI conference right now. And the NVIDIA CEO basically said something to the extent that, you know, they rule the world or something, you know, like <laughs> a really, really aggressive statement that I got it right here. I'm just, yeah, the thing was, we basically run everything. That was in statement. And again, that's very aggressive language. That kind of reminds me of the way that like, Enron's board members used to talk you know, before, <laughs> before Enron. And that NVIDIA, is, is, I don't think, is a fraud, but it's more like just a sign of the frothiness and mm -hmm. in the market. You know, the thing about NVIDIA is, you know, it has a $2.2 .2 billion market cap now. Apple has $2.6 billion and it has nowhere near the sales of Apple. You know, it's trading based all on growth. And one thing about these booms and new technologies, like in the 20s, you know, you had RCA and and companies that were into, you know, radios or cars were in the early inception. They all boomed during the 20s, but you would have made a lot more money in them after the bust of the 30s. Mm -hmm. and, and internet's the same way, you know, these companies all boomed in the internet in the 90s. But if you had bought Amazon or Apple or Google, you know, in the mid 2000s, you would have done a hell of a lot better than buying this stuff pre the dot-com bust. So that's the kind of way I feel about AI is that AI is no doubt going to be a huge growth industry, but you're probably going to make more money. And remember, NVIDIA is the inception. Let, let's look at cell phones. Who were the first big leaders? Nokia, Ericsson, Motorola, BlackBerry. Like They all have a very small percentage of the market now. And if you had held those for 25, 30 years, you would not have done well. Mm -hmm. So is NVIDIA really going to be the leader? You know, another, an internet, AOL was and Yahoo were two mm -hmm. of the big leaders and they nowhere ended up being the leaders 20 to 30 years later. So is NVIDIA really going to continue this? And we can look at the NVIDIA chart at some point here too, as well as all the other stuff we're going to talk about. But well, David, there was actually something I wanted to ask you about that, and we can do it now instead. But I wanted to get your take on, let's say, the behavior of this rally. You know, All of these equities, this insane growth also drives buybacks. So how much of this rally that we've seen in a lot of these stocks can be driven by the companies buying back their own shares? And what does that mean for the health of the overall market? 
Yeah, I think that's been a huge factor. Just actually this whole bull market going back to 2009. And I actually did articles on it and I called it, you know, the buyback bubble. And and what these companies had done when, when debt was so cheap is they've taken on an enormous amount of debt. I, a company like McDonald's or 3M or IBM, those kind of companies would be examples of that. Mm-hmm. And all they're doing is not really reinvesting back in their businesses, but they're buying back shares. Like if you go look at like one issue junior miners have is they always have to issue shares, right? They're the exact opposite, dilute to raise money to continue to drill because they don't have any cash flow or the whatnot. But one thing these companies have all been able to do, and we don't need to get into detail for the sake of this interview, but if you look at every major of the company, especially in major tech company, Microsoft, Apple, et cetera, mm-hmm. they all have less shares outstanding now than they did 10 years ago. So let me give you some basic math. Let's just say, let's make this easy. A company is making $100 million, right? And it has, I don't know, 100 million shares out. So it's making a dollar a share. Let's say it buys back 10% of its shares. Now it only has 10 to 90 million shares out. Mm-hmm. Well, now it makes a buck 11 per share. So all of a sudden, boom, their EPS is up 11% without even growing the top line. So that's why they're doing it. And you know, Wall Street doesn't really ever report price to sales. That's actually an indicator mm-hmm. that a lot of people use. Wall Street always just reports, or it doesn't report, you see revenues reported, but the main thing Wall Street always reports is not the amount of profit or amount of revenue, it's always the EPS. That's what everything trades off of. And if we see that, you see that's one reason, like you said, these companies have been driven higher that, you know, IBM hasn't really grown for years, but its stock and EPS is able to hold up because IBM has been one of the notorious stock buybacks. And I think the fourth quarter was a record, but I think now they're starting to slow down a bit. And one issue you're going to run into with stock buybacks is the major factor that drove them was cheap money. All of these companies could borrow at two, three percent. Well, now that's up to five, six, seven percent. And remember, even if they can't borrow new debt at two, three, it's not just that five, six, seven is going to be on the new debt. It's going to be on the debt they roll over. Like if you look at McDonald's again, as an example, McDonald's has just over 20 billion in revenues and they have over 30 billion in debt, you know, and they make whatever, I think about a couple billion on those 20 billion in revenues, 20 plus billion in revenues. There's no way they can pay off that 30 billion in debt, you know, with two to 3 billion in profit. Mm -hmm. So that means they have to continue to roll over the debt. And I did a study on it last summer, and that means that they have to continue to roll over and they're going to be rolling over the, a lot of that debt that they issued at 2 3% is now trading at 70 cents on the dollar, which means the new implied yield is 5 6%. So mm-hmm. their interest expenditure is going to go up. And what does that mean? Well, if all of a sudden they have to pay an extra 5, 6, 700 million in interest expenditure, it means that, again, McDonald's, that's 5, 6, 700 million a year less they're going to use on buybacks. So I think at some point, these higher rates are going to eat into those stock buybacks. And you're going to have to see these companies basically stop them. And we saw this in both the mining sector. And remember when the cruise lines collapsed after COVID started? Mm-hmm. What we saw is essentially companies start to try to pay back debt and stop doing stock buybacks because all of a sudden there was no return on equity for the stock buyback. And I think that's what you'll see at some point in these companies. They'll be like, well, you know what? It's not worth it anymore for us to borrow at 7% and buy back stock. We should just be getting rid of this debt because this debt is eating into our profitability. And of course, that's something they can do overnight, but it's something that they can do slowly. And here's another thing that happens. When companies get in distress, they tend to issue stock to get a quick cash injection. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it was Carnival or one of those cruise ship companies that when everything tanked, you know, again, after COVID started, and they couldn't get a bailout because a lot of these companies are registered offshore for tax reasons. Mm-hmm. And the U.S. government basically told you, no, 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 whatever. You're registered in the Bahamas or Bermuda or wherever because you don't want to pay tax. So you're not getting that government money. You know? So they just had to issue a crap load of shares to raise money to survive. And I, I remember seeing that like the 10 years of prior buybacks were basically wiped out in one foul swoop you know, by having to raise money at a much mm-hmm. lower level, which means you know more dilution, like to raise $50 million at $5.00. You have to issue a lot more shares and you know, raising $50 million at $30. So I think that's what you're going to see. So not only what I think you're going to see a slowdown in the stock buybacks due to higher interest rates, I think you're going to see these companies do the opposite and maybe at some point have to start to dilute because 
they're going to need cash injections as rates go higher and they're not going to want to borrow more. Which kind of ends up tying nicely into the bigger topic of the debt rolling over for the federal government. And that's yeah, something yeah. that that's exactly what we were going to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's going to happen with corporations as well. But, mm-hmm. but see, they're smarter than federal government in a way that most corporate debt is five, 10 years. Mm-hmm. And most government debt is one, two, three years. And this is what actually we'll, we'll start on this now, if you want to get the chart up here. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to show you two things here. Okay. So this is the 10 year bond yield here. Mm-hmm. And what we can see is this has gone essentially between, you know, 50 basis points in 2020 during the COVID lows. And now we're at basically, you know, the highs for decades at 4.29%. We want as high as 5%. So that shows you the kind of increase in borrowing costs, but very little of the government debt is in this range. I think 70% or more of the U.S. government debt is in the one to three year range. And of course, now from COVID, that stuff's all being rolled over. And remember, they issued something like seven or eight trillion of new debt in 2020 and 2021 because they were doing all the stimulus packages and the whatnot during COVID. So this is what came to my attention as the potential kind of, I don't want to call it a black swan because I think everyone knows that the US and Canadian and Western government debt is too high. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realize the rollover was so large this year. So Mark Haloesco, he lives here in the Bahamas. He's Bahamian. He took over for John Templeton when Templeton was getting out of his funds and now he runs hedge funds. So he posted this on Twitter that 17 trillion of treasury bonds come due in the next three to six months. Average interest rate is well below current rates. I would think the average interest rate in that stuff is one to 2%. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to look at the two year. So the two year bond, which is again, where most of this stuff is located. And what we can see is that the two year bond for the most part of the last 13, 14 years spent below was below 1%, other than a year or two where it only went to about 2%, 2.5% mm-hmm. in 2018, 2019. And then you know, actually spent a full two years at a quarter of a percent when they borrowed all that money. So again, let's just say for argument's sake, the, that average government debt's roughly 1.5%. That'd be like roughly $200 billion in interest payments a year. Well, if that is now going to be 5%, you're talking about and a 17 trillion rollover, that is going to be closer to eight to 900 billion. So right there, you're talking six, 700 billion, which is about two to 3% of US GDP in added interest. You know, right now the deficit is estimated to be about 1.8 trillion in the US. Mm-hmm. Boom, that knocks it up to 2.4 billion, just like that, just by billion interest. Or trillion? Oh, it's to 2.4 trillion, sorry. Okay. That adds it up to that's extra 600, 700 billion in interest, puts it up to 2.5 trillion, just like that. And the amount of debt, the Federal Reserve is is decreasing his balance sheet still. You know, when they issued a lot of that debt in 2020 and 2021, they were doing QE, they were buying some of that debt. Well, now this is all going to be issued and can the market really absorb? Now, I've seen different numbers on that number. Like this is a Yahoo, this is an Apollo thing uh, last year. They were one of the first people who pointed this out last year. Mm-hmm. They say it's 10 trillion in 2024. So, but is that fiscal 2024, which ends, I think it's the end of October in the States, and there's still three more months after that, or, you know, or two more months after that. Remember, that's coming to the market. The US is also running a $2 trillion deficit. So that tells me that the number is going to be between 12 and 17 trillion, which is 50 to 65% of GDP. I just don't think the market can absorb that. And I don't think there's going to be a lot of demand for that with debt as high as it is in the US. And so forget if the Fed cuts or they don't cut. This kind of supply shock onto the market could really push interest rates higher. Mm -hmm. And that's becoming my fear now. So you combine that with what we were talking about earlier. Well, I'll get the NVIDIA stuff. When you got stuff like this going on, which is like, how more parabolic can you get than that? (laughs) The NVIDIA chart, when you have like these huge bubbles going on and you're entering this period where they're going to issue a lot of debt, it really, really worries me. And I know maybe your people are like, wow, you did a quick 180 from just a few months ago. But I remember in 2007, you know, being kind of bullish at the beginning of the year and then hearing about the subprime stuff. I didn't do enough due diligence into it. And I just owned really at the time gold and silver shares. I was a younger guy. I was 29, 30 years old. And I just figured, oh, like, oh, one, they'll do fine when there's a bear market like 2001, 2002. And they didn't. They got slaughtered with the market in 2008 when there was this big margin call and everything. So ever since then, I've been kind of cognizant of risks. And I think right now, NVIDIA, 
you know, and these other tech stocks being frothy combined with this potential amount of debt that could hit the market could really, really be worrisome going forward. And the thing is, too, let's face it, with that two year treasury, you know, and that's where most of the debt is issued. Like this basically is just tracking the Fed funds rate. It's a little below it. You know, the Fed funds rate's about five and a quarter. Mm -hmm. But what happens if this only goes to say four? Well, still, all that debt's going to have to be issued at four instead of whatever, you know, a 5%. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to make that huge of a difference. And rates are never going back to this level. This was a secular low in interest rates. And the reason I was showing that 10-year bond earlier is I just wanted to show how stupid the government was where they could have just taken advantage of those low rates, you know, and issued a lot of that for two years, essentially in 2020 and 2021, we had the 10 year yield under 175. They could have just issued bonds between half of bit, you know, 50 basis points to 175, and then not had to worry about it for 10 years, mm -hmm. but they chose to do it short term. Now their argument is they're the reserve currency of the world. So people want liquidity and they want the short term debt. Fair enough. But I think prudency would have said, hey, let's do some longer term debt because we got to take advantage of these low rates. And then we don't have to worry about rolling it over for another 10 years. Like Austria, for example, during you know, the QE you know, and bubble and, and, and bond bubble of 2020, 2021, 2020, they were issuing 100 year bonds. Mm -hmm. Now, those 100 year bonds are in Austria are down like 80 percent in value. But hey, they took advantage. They were yielding like two, three percent in a 100 year bond. Mm -hmm. So they took advantage of that. And I don't think the U.S. government took advantage of it. And I remember Biden saying in 2021 when he was elected that we got to spend, you know, when he did his stimulus project, you got to take advantage of these low rates. Well, I kind of short sighted when <laughs> not thinking that, hey, maybe in two or four years when this stuff has to be rolled mm -hmm. over, rates are going to be much higher. So, David, is that the market dictating what it wants for a maturity on those bonds? I think what's going on in both the commodities markets and the interest rate markets mm -hmm. is exactly that. I think at some point, people are saying, look, now it's riskier return, right? You know, before all this financial engineering really happened, before, you know, the 2008 financial cr crisis, the US debt to GDP was like 60%. It's basically doubled, but now it's over 120%. So I think it's the market saying, hey, yeah, you have to give us more return on these bonds. Because now the debt is out of control and your spending's out of control. You know, when we talk about this two trillion dollar deficit this year, you know, the economy is twenty seven trillion. You're talking seven percent of GDP at a time where the economy is still in growth mode. Like that's mm. the kind of deficit you get during the height of recessions. So you're probably going to go back to three to four trillion. And at some point, I think you're going to get a sovereign debt crisis. And my opinion is, yeah, the reason you've seen the sell off on bonds. And this breakout in gold, and we're seeing all commodities rally, is that's the market anticipating. Like they're going to have to do more QE at some point, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to have to buy this debt up because either they're going to default on the debt, which is not going to happen, or they're going to going to have to monetize it. And remember, when they monetize it, let's say the debt is forty trillion, and the average interest rate is ten percent, just to make it easy. Okay, you know, so it's four trillion a year. The U.S. government budget's like six point six trillion. They're bankrupt at that point. But if they own half the debt, I mean, two trillion of that four trillion in interest will just go right back to the treasury. So it makes it a little more sustainable. Mm -hmm. So you know that's why too, when you look at the government debt being thirty four trillion right now, it's really only like I think twenty eight trillion because I think the Fed owns about six trillion of it. So that seventeen trillion, well, how much does it just roll over onto the Fed's balance sheet too? But still, you know, the majority of it is still going to hit the market, and the U.S. is not like Japan. The advantage Japan had was Japan's debt is all domestically owned, so they could kind of keep interest rates low as their debt exploded. With the U.S., this is the catch-22, I guess, being the reserve currency. On the one hand, it's great. You can borrow all this money. Everyone uses U.S. Do dollars. But on the other hand, you have all these foreign owners of the debt who are going to say, hey, we want more return on our money. Japan didn't have that problem, right? Mm -hmm. Japan's debt was all... It's all basically domestically owned. So I think when I look at gold breaking out and people are like, well, like, you know, I thought gold was going to break out because of interest rate cuts. Well, those cuts keep getting pushed back. So you're like, why is gold breaking out? Why is, I'll just get the, the CRB we can see here, the commodities index. You can see the CRB is near its resistance level and looks like it could break out. Mm 
and start going back to those 2022 highs. Mm -hmm. So why are commodities starting to break out? And even with the Fed not really signaling, and we're doing this interview, by the way, the morning of the Fed meeting, and I think they're going to have be kind of hawkish. That, March, that's March 20th. Opinion. Mm -hmm. and, and the question is, why is this happening? And I think those markets are anticipating that, hey, this debt load is too much. And at some point, I could see a scenario where they have to keep interest rates sort of high because of inflation, but they're monetizing. You know, It's not going to be like the past 15 years where they're doing QE with rates at zero. No, like interest rates stay at whatever, 5 6%. And they're monetizing debt at the same time. So I got a feeling that the commodities markets, the gold market, precious metals markets are starting to anticipate this, that this... 12 to 17 trillion is going to hit the market. And at some point it could be monetized. And you know, if we go look, you know, what happened in the Great Depression is the stock market crash kind of launched it. Or if we look at the 87 crash, interest rates going from about 6% on the 10-year bond to 9% were a big factor in the market crashing. But maybe if this, again, all of this debt hits the market and pushes the longer term rates or rates in general higher, even without Fed rate hikes, Maybe that's kind of what triggers some kind of market event. And then that triggers them having to go into QE. And then there's all kinds of other debt that's out of control too. Like credit card debt, I think is at the highest level since the early nineties. And, you know, people are behind on their, on their car payments and all of that stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So David, there's a couple of things I wanted to kind of pick back up on there. When this debt gets reissued, can the market dictate that it wants a shorter maturity on that debt, considering, let's say, the real rate of return on those bonds. And they'll usually they set the amount of debt they want to issue. And like because of liquidity factors, usually the demand for government debt is, especially the reserve currency, is shorter term in nature. But especially with the 10 year bond yielding lower than the two year bond right now. Again, mm -hmm. you look at the 10 year bond here, as I've stated, it's 429 and the two year bond is 468. There's obviously going to be more demand for the two-year treasury. And a lot of those issuances, you know, they're those kind of bonds that are like the fixed market where they don't trade up and down. They just like you get your 4.6%. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you buy a lot of 10-year bonds, you have that price fluctuation where, you know, if again, we go look at them, um, I'll throw up the TLT here, which is, you know, the ETF that tracks the 10 and 30-year bond, you know, it's gone from 160 to 93. So if you had bought this at the high, you would have lost 40%. And at that point, it was only yielding half a percent. So you basically lost 80 years worth of interest payment. So I think the market always dictates you know, that short end. Mm -hmm. But I think the government always issues more of that short end. But I think now there'll be even more of a demand. Now, I know that back in the 80s, there was actually a lot of demand for long-term bonds because you had that 15, 17% return in 1980, 1981 at the height of the interest rate cycle. So there actually was demand for them because people can make 17% a year and inflation never really got that high. So you're making real return. And of course, inflation ended up coming down for the next 20 or 30 years afterwards. And actually, I, I knew someone who bought one of those bonds and they retired a lot of those bonds in the mid 90s. They just bought them out the government because they were like, we don't want to pay this 15% anymore. Now that makes that sense. Six or percent, right? On, on a 10 year bond. But I think there'll be there'll be some demand. But again, it's just supply. You know, you got 12 to 17 trillion with the new debt issuance combined with the rollover. Again, that's a huge amount of money, 17 trillion. That's two thirds almost of the economy. Like, can really the market soak that up? Mm -hmm. You know, like the entire stock market right now is worth like 40 trillion. Like, so you're talking 40% of the value of the stock market heating in one year in government bonds. I just think that's too much supply on the market and they almost have to monetize. And I don't even know, is the Fed looking at this? Because a lot of times people say, you know, the Fed, you know, if you go look at 1929, they a lot of people argue they kept rates, you know, too high, too long. They said that in Japan in 1990 after the bubble burst. And that's what led to this kind of malaise in Japan. Mm -hmm. They feel the Japanese central bank should have been more aggressive in, in cutting rates at that time in 1991. And are they kind of guilty of just looking at these short-term inflation numbers? And let's face it, we're going to get higher inflation ultimately anyhow, because they're going to have to monetize this debt. And should they kind of be bringing this down just to bring the cost of the debt down? So 
just to quickly look to at the TLT, I just want to point something out here. We're right support right now. You can see this rally that occurred off the bottom. And we're right at support now, which is about 92 to 93. Mm -hmm. So if we break that, I think there's a chance we can go back to those lows. So either we got to hold or we break that. And I think if you start getting those long bond interest rates, remember, and this is where you go to consumer debt, mortgage debt isn't like based on that two-year bond. That's government debt. Mortgage debt is based more on the five, 10, 30-year bond. So if those rates start going higher again, and you have housing prices essentially at all-time highs, and these mortgage rates are backing up again, and just interest rates on everything, credit cards, car loans, I think that is your risk factor in there. Now, look, it, we have to be honest with ourselves here. The stock market is right at its all-time highs. We're still in the AI you know, tech frenzy. So we're nowhere close right now. The, the internals of the market are pretty strong. The, actually, the number of stocks trading over the 200-day moving average on the S&P is the highest since July 2021. Hmm. And that usually doesn't happen at the top. Usually there's an internal top followed by maybe a, a top in the indices where the, the uh, internals are eroding. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened in 2021, by the way, because that number was nowhere near as high at the market top in December of 2021. So we might have some time in kind of this topping formation, but I think that's kind of where we are right now in here. And actually another thing I pointed out recently on my blog, and I'll just quickly show you this. We have a potential Dow theory sell that the Dow, you can see it broke out above its 2021 highs, but the transports are actually, they're, they're lower and they're quite a bit lower. You can see the transports are actually probing, breaking the 200 day moving average and below the 2021 highs. And by the way, that worked in 2022. You can see the transports trended lower where the industrials made a new high right at the beginning of 2022. And that was a non-confirmation. For those who are unaware, the Dow theory say, states that the transports and the Dow should have to you know, confirm each other's moves. And it's, the problem is it's not a perfect theory in that sometimes it can be short-term orientated. The, you know, it could be a few weeks they don't confirm each other and then everything falls apart. And then sometimes it can be like this, like in 1999, and lasted like a year before mm -hmm. the market started to roll over. So, it, you know, and you can see in, in the case of this, you know, the Dow started making new highs in December and, you know, we're four months into this and, you know, the market's still at its highs. So who knows when this could say, but if this continues, like the Dow theory is basically, other than the 2018 decline, every bear market going back to 1987, the Dow theory has predicted it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to see these correlations over time and see where they kind of catch back up. But one thing I wanted to kind of go back to, David, is this understanding who is actually driving interest rates. You know, we hear the Fed adjusting rates, but it seems like the market has a lot more control of where rates need to be rather than this perception that the Fed has all the control. And I think that's something that we don't often think about. Well, that's interesting because I, when I was talking to a friend, I was telling him, look, at in 87, these long-term bonds going up in rates were kind of one thing to help crack the market. And I was saying, look, if, if that, again, if that TLT breaks and this 10-year bond starts going back to, you know, 5% or something, and he was just like, well, back when that happened then, that's when the Fed started becoming more dovish and you had this rally, you know, the bond yields went from 5% to about 4% on the 10-year. And I'm like, well, what happens if they lose control? Because mm -hmm. that that's called the bong vigilantes, they used to call them, right? Where these traders would just say, no, no, your debt is too high and you have to pay a lot more than even you want to on your debt. So th that's the kind of thing you have to start thinking about. What happens, like you just said, what happens if they start losing control somewhat? And when they lose control, that's when essentially, we're, we're not used to that. We're used to the Fed, even during the financial crisis. Okay, they had to bail out the financial system, but with interest rates themselves, they have been in control over. You know, they've raised rates to 5% and the 10-year bond's never gone above 5%. So they're, even though you know this interest expenditure on the US debt is exploding, because of higher rates, because they're trying to you know kill off inflation, they still are kind of under control. But what happens if they lose control? And when they lose control is that scenario I talked about earlier. It's that scenario where they have to print money and keep rates elevated because inflation is high and just to monetize the debt. So I don't know when that's going to happen. Like That's something that I've been worried about for 30 years. <laughs> and obviously that hasn't it's been something not to worry about for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. But 
at some point they'll kind of like you know lose control of that market. Remember, even during the late seventies when rates were double digits, the the debt to GDP in the seventies was only thirty or forty percent. So they could handle that. And remember, they they eventually pushed the short term rates, you know, up into the double digits because they wanted to kill off inflation. So they never really lost control back then either. Mm-hmm. Like losing control is like these countries that go into hyperinflation. It's like Argentina or Venezuela. You know, their currencies collapse because you know, Iceland, when it said it, it currency totally collapsed during the financial crisis, that's losing control. And we haven't seen the US really lose control. Like we kind of saw that if we want to talk about losing control, the Brits lost control. You now, if you remember, when remember their rates were spiking and mm-hmm. these pension funds were getting killed in the UK and they had to do a big, and that's just kind of what I'm talking about. The UK central bank did not cut interest rates, but they did kind of boom a one-time QE to kind of buy the bonds to put a level underneath the bonds, you know, and cap the rate you know, increases. That's losing control because for a few days there, the UK central bank did lose control of their bond market. And it was having very dire potential consequences for the pension funds and their equity market and et cetera. So we're not there yet. Like we're still there. The Fed is still somewhat under control. My my question is when this 12 to 17 trillion hits this summer and fall, do they start to lose control? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So David, let's also make it a little bit more explicit for those that might not understand what monetizing the debt really means. Essentially what they're doing is they're printing money and I'll get the US debt clock up again, you know. So they're essentially printing money to try to cap interest rates or keep interest rates low or you know basically fund the government cuz like they wanted stimulus both after you know the financial crisis and after covid when the economy was in when pretty deep uh, recessions so they're essentially printing money to subsidize the government borrow and then it's on the fed's balance sheet so it's a bit of a ponzi scheme in a way cuz one reason japan has been able to survive with debt to gdp of north of 250% Mm-hmm. As I think almost half the debt in, J- in Japan is owned by the central bank. So basically, their real debt is actually only 120%. And you know, Japan's got some of the lowest interest in the world. Now, by the way, interest still eats up a huge chunk of the Japanese budget deficit because the debt itself is so huge. Mm-hmm. But what happens with that is like that interest just goes right to the Fed and they pay the treasury. So it's almost like you're paying yourself. So like I said, it's a bit of a scam in a way, but the government can do it, right? You know, if you did that yourself in real life, like, oh, I'm going to print money and borrow from myself and then pay myself the interest, (laughs) you know, you'd be charged with some kind of fraud, but the government does it, it's fine. But that's what monetizing the debt is. You're really trying to subsidize these massive deficits so the government can do stimulus during these downturns and to keep borrowing cheap for consumers during these downturns and also to keep interest, you know, very boring interest bearing investments like depressed. So people will go and spend in the economy, right? Go, you know, like maybe invest in stocks or invest in housing or, or, you know, spend because they'll be like, well, I have to be aggressive because I'm not getting anything on my interest bearing debt. But at some point, I think the monetization of the debt, it becomes hyperinflationary. You can't do this, you know, kind of forever. And like one thing that we have seen now in the debt, I'm just going to show you the yen chart. One thing that's really happened is the yen has completely tanked recently because they don't have the ability because their debt is so high to like, they finally got out of negative interest rates or like the last country to do it. And you can see the yen, it's actually, I'm using this is the, the, the reverse one. You know, the other one would trade higher because the yen's like whatever, 150 yen. But what I just want to show you is, you know, basically this index goes from 92 to 65. That's nearly a 30% or 25 to 30% decline in the last couple of years. And and that's kind of because Japan doesn't have the ability to raise interest rates to attract capital, and they and they're monetizing their debt. Like one reason the Nikkei has gone up to new highs is that they really ramped up the monetization in 2014, 10 years ago, mm-hmm. and the balance sheet of the Japanese central bank has gone crazy. So again, they kind of did that to kind of juice other asset markets because you know at markets in Japan had been depressed for so long. It's not because the Japanese economies turned around and they got out of that multi-decade malaise. They're still barely growing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's because of of this 
So this is where monetization, what I'm trying to show really leads to is that you're going to see increased depreciation in your currency. So that's where it's going to lead to. Now, the issue is, I don't know how much the US dollar against the Canadian dollar or against the euro mean anything because they're all going to be monetizing at the same time. So again, we look to something like gold, we look to commodities, we look to real assets, and we look to these things and they're like, those are the things that will be going up in price. And, and even things like the stock market after maybe an initial bust and housing could do very well. Like the Argentinian market, you're going to, uh, this is a chart for all ages, by the way, I'll show you right now. You can see it's at 1.1 million, right? If we go back 19 years in the Argentinian, so this is in peso terms, mm -hmm. this thing was 1,500. <laughs> it's gone to <laughs> 1,500. So it's just basically because of inflation mm -hmm. that's happened. And this is a logarithmic scale. We'll get a, a linear scale. <laughs> it looks like the NVIDIA chart, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's what happens. And that's why rich people don't get hurt as much during hyperinflation because they own the assets. So if you were so a rich person in Argentina who owned Argentinian stocks or you know, gold in Argentinian terms of, in peso terms is, you know, gone up like gangbusters. So, uh, you know, but a, a poor person who's just, you know, living hand to mouth every week is not going to own these assets like that, you know, or like if you own your house debt free, you know, your house is, will it also go out uh, up ultimately. But my theory has always been that if we're getting into very high inflation, I don't mean 8%. I'm talking, I don't know if we'll ever see Argentinian type inflation in the United States, but if you're going to get into double digits, 20, 30%, because they really just have to get rid of this debt is that you would probably see some kind of deflationary or disinflationary bust first, mm -hmm. and then this afterwards. So what does the rollover of this debt mean for the markets? Is that basically pulling liquidity from the markets back into the treasury market? Like, How does that actually, what is the, the let's say, the, the mechanism that affects the liquidity within the system? I think the liquidity is there's just not enough demand there. Mm -hmm. Like in the private market, you know, it's just like, look, you're too indebted and it's just like, there might even not be enough money there. You know, there's, there's the $17 trillion, a lot of money. And it's just, there's not the demand there to meet that. And that money either wants to be in other asset classes or quite simply, there's not enough money there in mm -hmm. circulation. Like one reason Argentina, why do they have hyperinflation? It's because, you know, they've had this out of control, corrupt socialist government for decades. And mainly he's tried to change that. But it's because there's not enough money in their system. So the government is just making up the money and lack of you know ways of, of funding the government because they can't exactly go to the debt market and they just are funding it by printing. So that's essentially what it is. Either there's not the demand there for it anymore or just to meet the government you know, amount of money that they want to spend, they have to basically make up for it by printing money because there's not enough money in the system to fund what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, it's, it's the old debasement of the Roman coins where like, you know, the coins had so much silver in them, you know, in zero AD. And then they didn't even have any silver in them by 500 AD when the Roman empire collapsed. So it's, it's essentially that, you know, and that's where you got into the gold and silver thing and gold and silver have always, you know, if you had a gold coin in Rome, you know, in 500 AD, it would have bought you a lot of things. You know, whereas a Roman coin wouldn't have bought you anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I kind of want to go back to this other idea of the markets driving things versus the Fed. Is it possible, do you think, that the Fed, by coming out in mid-December and Powell, you know, in, in a lot of ways, completely changing his stance or his verbiage on being hawkish, that the market did this easing of financial conditions, which ends up being more of a driver for gold than the actual slashing of the interest rates. Yeah, I think like, you, again, you look at this and you look at like, there's other factors too. You know, we had the Bitcoin ETF, so that drove Bitcoin higher and these other asset markets higher. Mm -hmm. And obviously we've seen continued rally in the tech sector. It's like by doing that, and this is where I'm, I'm getting to with this, you know, these asset markets go higher and it also kind of keeps inflation elevated. Mm -hmm. So he kind of, did again like it like a catch twenty two or double edged sword where it's like you came out as more dovish and then like you said the asset markets and and markets kind of reset themselves but that in turn I think has you know we're we're not seeing inflation come down the last few months so it kind of caused that and it put them in this difficult situation where now they're trying to talk the market down and saying okay no there's not going to be these five or six rate hikes there's only going to be like two 
right? You know, or two or three. So yeah, I think the market kind of, in a way, even though expecting these rate cuts, essentially in a way, is kind of doomed them because all of these markets going up keeps inflation elevated. You know, and a lot of young people, Gen Zers, Gen Xers, they own this crypto stuff. So that kind of can keep consumer spending and retail spending elevated. If all of a sudden people feel richer and keep spending and that keeps inflation higher, right? Because mm-hmm. your Bitcoin has gone from, you know, 40,000 to 70,000 in the last few months. Or, or And then, of course, a lot of these smaller alt- altcoins can happen. You know, of course, we all know that there was that wealth effect. They really said it happened in the late 90s where... When the stock market and dot coms are going up like crazy, yeah, it drove consumer spending because you had these these companies going up 10, 20 times in value. And then, you know, it was uh, that was when my generation, generation, you know, X was the younger generation. And all of a sudden people felt rich and were buying Lamborghinis and Ferraris and expensive houses and and the whatnot. So it kind of becomes that self, you know, prophecy. And then the market itself, like I anticipated it, and then now it's kind of being taken away. But I think one thing, too, that the market is not anticipating, and this gets into my theory earlier, the Fed loses control, is that it's just one thing it's just it does anticipate is the Fed is not going to raise interest rates and the interest rates are not going to go higher. But what happens again if the supply of debt forces rates higher? And I think that's where it is. And by the way, I don't believe in efficient market theory. I believe in what George Soros states and forget Soros' politics and what you think of him. But I, mm-hmm. I totally agree with this one statement that he calls it reflexivity, where markets overshoot one way or another. And he says that the markets are always wrong. Yeah. And I mean, so overshoot, he's, like, he's famous for seeing those disconnects, right? Yeah. He wrote a book right before calling for the financial crisis. And I think Soros didn't become famous as one of the big short guys, but I think his fund made one or 2% in 2008, because he hedged so heavily, if he was really worried about what could happen, he called it the super bubble. And uh, he's got a book. It's a really short book. It's a tough read because it's very, very, you know, it's <laughs> it's very, very academic in the read. Mm-hmm. But he wrote about uh, back then. And of course, he broke, we talk about breaking the Bank of England. That's one of his most famous uh, trades, talking about, again, central bank losing control. That was exactly the Bank of England had to hike interest rates up to huge levels mm-hmm. to protect their currency because the pound was tanking because the market kind of broke them. So so the question is now, is the market wrong in terms of, okay, the Fed, maybe they're not going to cut as much as we think, but they're not going to raise rates. But again, if this excess amount of debt being levied onto the market kind of breaks the bond market, what happens then? Because mm-hmm. You know, the market was wrong in 2007. You know, the housing market was already busting and the S&P kept making new highs till October. So the market was wrong. The market was just saying, okay, there's nothing to worry about. And by the next year, there were things to worry about. So that's Mm -hmm. that's the thing you have to look at. And remember, like the market's wrong on the downside. Like go look at where Amazon was trading in 2001. You know, that's, that's the only investment anyone ever had to make was buy Amazon in 2001. And you've made basically a thousand times on your money mm-hmm. in, a, in 20 years. And, you know, the market was completely wrong in anticipating. And then on the on the reverse side, go look at the 3D printing stocks in 2014. They're kind of doing what NVIDIA is doing now. They all went parabolic. Mm-hmm. Now they're all off 90%. So those type of parabolic curves are usually the ultimate in reflexivity that the market is wrong in anticipating all this growth and gets overzealous and whatever stock or index that happens to is down. And like I said, there's no guarantee NVIDIA is going to rule the world. Like uh, there was a stock called iOmega in 1997 mm-hmm. and they were making external hard drives because at that time, you know, that had CD-ROMs and stuff in them, right? Because at that time, CD-ROMs were coming the big thing to play your music off or store stuff on. And a lot of computers didn't come equipped with them. Mm-hmm. So people would buy this iOmega drive and this stock went through the roof from like, you know, a couple of dollars a share to hundreds of dollars a share, then collapsed and then ended up getting taken over for almost nothing. Mm-hmm. So that was a perfect example in that reflexivity. It, it, it's, it's tough to explain, I understand, but my big theory is the market is not anticipating, regardless how many times the Fed cuts. It's not really about that anymore. Mm-hmm. The market is almost totally not anticipated that rates can go higher here. Now they're anticipating that rates could go lower. There's a great uh, trading documentary. It's a lot of fun too, to watch. Mm-hmm. It's in 1998. It's called Bulls and Bears. It's about this guy named John, quote unquote, Rambo Malden. They, they call him Rambo. He's got this big 
husky voice. He was an American guy who moved to Australia. And he it's a, it goes on during the Russian crisis in 98. And yeah, he ends up losing all his money. Then he switches positions around. And then he makes a ton of money. That's in that show. But he's a, he's a really funny character. But one thing that's interesting about the documentary is they talk about when the market starts to tank, because he's in Australia, they're talking about the Australian Central Bank were wanting to cut interest rates, you know, stimulate the market. Mm-hmm. And they had to turn around and they had to raise interest rates by hundreds of basis of points because that 98, 97, 98 cri- crisis was epicenter was in Asia. And it was killing the Australian dollar because Australia does obviously a lot more of their trade in Asia than with you know, North America or Europe. Mm-hmm. And they had to basically protect their currency. So that's the same thing. Because that market failed. They, they, they were just like, oh, they're going to stimulate. But instead, they had to do the opposite. And what happens again if that happens now? What happens if because of this excess supply on the market, interest rates do actually go higher on the longer end and midterm, mid end where they're issuing the debt and the market's not anticipating that at all now? Mm-hmm. David, when we think about, in some ways, these cycles that are coinciding, whether it's this debt cycle that is coming to maturity this year, along with that Dow theory, how do we look at, let's say, the price of gold along with the CapEx cycle for the miners? Is that kind of lining up into this time where you know there has been such little CapEx spending in the mining sector that this can lead to a period of undersupply, which you know, ends up being the the cure for low prices is low prices and driving prices back up because of the unavailability, let's say. Again, if you go to my stock chart of the day on on YouTube or just my website, addictedtoprofits.net, yeah, it's probably the easiest way on addictedtoprofits.net because they're right there. Mm -hmm. On March 19th, so that was a Tuesday, I did an article on just what you're talking about. I did, I just said it's commodities about to outperform equities now. And one thing I talk about about in the commodity cycle is that we've seen a real lack of investment. You know, people like Frank Dreister are calling for pension funds in Canada to allocate a small amount of funds into, you know, the mining companies because there's no investment in the industry. And I think it got taken out of context when he said you want the government to do it. They're acting like he wants Trudeau to write the you know mining sector check. No, what he wants is the, you know, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan or these big pension plans to say, hey, we're going to allocate a couple percent of our money into junior mining because number one, it's a big, it's a large sector in Canada that employs a lot of people. And number two, if you really want to do your Green New Deal stuff, you need nickel, copper, cobalt, lithium, you know, zinc, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what he really was talking about. Well, when I, when I get back to that, it's, yeah, there's such a lack of investment in that industry right now. If you get higher prices now going forward in this kind of inflationary spiral, and if that coincides with kind of like the bursting of the stock market bubble, I think you can see money really driven into the sector. That's what you saw in the 2000s. The tech bubble exploded, you know, exploded to the downside. And then we had not had not had a lot of investment, you know, since Prex declined in, in 97 for five or six years. And that led to investment in the junior mining sector. And I did another study and I showed, I went back to 2017 and I looked at Bitcoin because I I have no problem with Bitcoin or crypto personally, but I think it's a risk on asset. I think it's mm-hmm. something that, I don't think Bitcoin has broken out recently because of the potential of them monetizing debt. No, no, no. I, obviously the ETF has driven inflows, but I think Bitcoin has driven, you know, has gone up because it's a reflection of the you know tech stock equity market bubble. And I showed every time there's a drawdown on the markets, 2018, 2020, 2022, Bitcoin falls. And not only does it fall, it falls like twice as much as the NASDAQ does. So it's a risk on asset. It goes up way more than tech stocks and other risk on assets during the booms and way more down in the bus. And why I think that's important is that if there's this bust in the market and then again, they monetize debt, you know, Bitcoin's going to be down a lot from whatever level it tops out at. And again, that I think that could again drive money into the mining sector because I think the mining sector could be breaking out out of the same time. And these all of these other assets have kind of been decimated going into maybe the next inflationary cycle. And like, and yeah, like for example, junior miners that CDNX index, mm-hmm. it's off eighty percent from its pre financial crisis two thousand seven highs. If you just that for the seventeen years of inflation, it's probably off close to ninety percent inflation adjusted. So. It's a very, very cheap, you know, you got companies that trade are trading at 
a quarter to a fifth of what they should be judged by their inferred or indicated, you know, resource in the ground. Mm -hmm. So I do think, you know, the solution for low prices is higher prices, et cetera. I do think that if you get this initial move in commodities from what you're talking about, the lack of investment in the industry, there's, you know, supply shortages, et cetera, et cetera. Higher costs also mean you need higher prices to be profitable. That then leads to more demand in that, you know, in that industry. And last thing to, to say here, when they do QE, when they loosen, not money doesn't usually go into the prior market's bubble. Like the loose money in the 90s went into tech stocks, right? Mm -hmm. the, loose, the loose money in the 2000s went into housing, gold, precious metals, commodities, emerging markets. In the 2010s, the loose money has again gone into tech stocks and housing. And, and I think Emerging markets are really cheap, by the way, compared to the states. They did not participate. So I think the next whatever cycle we have will probably be more like the 2000s or the 70s, which is, again, is emerging markets, commodities, inflation plays. Right. This rotation from the pieces of the economy that <laughs> in some ways probably drove a lot of speculation and then the momentum came out of that. And then we have to rotate back into these other these other sectors that have been A, underinvested in, B, this kind of mean reversion piece that has to come back, right? Well, and like, look, right now you have a lot of things that don't make any sense. It's like, how can you want this green revolution? But there's no investment, again, going into mining. And even Elon Musk has called for like nickel, copper, cobalt, lithium, zinc, all these things need to be mined. So if you have no money going into that sector, your battery your solar panel is just not going to appear, mm -hmm. right? So, and it's going to be a lot more expensive. So, like, forget these macro dynamics we're talking about with debt and inflation and money printing. If you want to like fulfill this green dream, and you know, I'm very wary of this dream, but if you want to at least try, you need money to go into the sector. So it makes no sense in a lot of, you know, in, in a lot of ways that like, hey, like, you know, like that's what the thing that always drives me nuts about crypto. And I know maybe I'll sound like an you go, you'll call me a boomer or call me old fashioned. It's like these little coins don't, they're not going to add anything or produce anything, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm talking like Dogecoin or whatever. It's like you want to buy your electric car and you want to buy it cheaper. You want to put solar panels on your house and you want the battery storage to be cheaper. You need people to invest in mining, you know, investing in some generic coin, which is just a basic fabrication of something that's in the internet is not going to like lead to that quality of life getting better and these in these things becoming more accessible that you need if you want to go into this like I said this green direction mm -hmm. or you know, in general if you want you know, the emerging world is still booming you know in the West maybe we're stagnating but they're going to need you know more resources because they're going to use more cars they're going to use more cell phones they're going to use you know they're going to buy nicer apartments that you know are going to require concrete and steel and all that sort of stuff in it. So you need investments in those sectors. And that's why, for example, China basically has kind of raped Africa to basically secure those metals coming back to China. Mm -hmm. You know, and they've and they've done a lot of that because they've invested in there. They're getting a lot of those metals up below market prices. But you need to invest in those sectors. We have these politicians on the one hand that talk this big game, they want to go in this direction of green, but then they don't want to make the investments in the sectors that will, you know, kind of kind of feed this. So it's, it's this whole conundrum. You keep thinking of why is there no investment in the mining sector when it's not just the regular mining cycle? Okay, prices go up like the 70s and okay, it's profitable mine. So there's going to be money coming to the sector. It's like strategically, you kind of need this stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So I think at some point that's going to turn. And I think you know, I remember when I started out in the early 90s and it was just completely dead in the mining sector. And I watched, you know, being again, being a young guy I was in my early 20s that time. I watched all my buddies coming out of college, you know, getting in JDS Uniphase and Nortel and they end up losing their butts. And I was in the mining sector struggling. And that's kind of like right now, like, you know, like the newsletter side of my business, consulting side of my business is not great right now, <laughs> to say the least. But and you see all these people making money in tech. But, you know, the, the, the tide is, I think at some point, this is is going to turn from both you know price structure, the fact that governments, from what they want to do, ultimately, strategically, the money has to come into that sector, and like you said, it's just that's the natural rotation of markets. Mm 
mm-hmm. that it never rolls in the prior boom. Like a lot of people don't know this, that after the Great Depression, you know, stocks still did nothing till 1949. There was a huge boom in commodities in the 30s and 40s because the stimulus was all in the real economy, right? The stimulus was, you know, let's get people working again. Let's build the Hoover Dam. We've got to build munitions and tanks for World War II. It was all in the real economy. It wasn't just in the financial economy. So commodity prices had a huge boom after that 1933 low into the early 50s. And I think right now it's kind of similar where after whenever this bust happens, if it's this year, next year, whatever, I think that it will happen within the next year or two, that the move won't be into the prior bubble. It will probably be into this. Because look, let's say there is a bust and there's a bad recession, even with the government's fiscal problems. If they do do any sort of stimulus, they're going to be like, let's get people back to work again. You know, let's not just jack the stock market up again. That's, I think, what's going to happen. But anyhow, you know, I'm talking a bit in circles here. I wanted, but I just wanted to say that, yeah, I agree that it's going to have to go into the commodity sector. And I think the fact, again, the governments have slated themselves into like promoting this whole green thing, which needs minerals, kind of helps that out as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. This past weekend, I was in a big US city in this very, let's say, urban part where people don't really have to travel all that far to necessarily get groceries or anything. And I found myself thinking about you know, exactly this problem of all of these people that live in a very you know, dense part of the city, all seemingly, obviously, this is a bit of a painting with a broad brush. They all believe in this green transition, this green dream. And yet, I don't think many of them understand or take into consideration where the actual material for that transition comes from, where the energy that they are burning now comes from, where you know a lot of these raw products come from. And I think, unfortunately, having a rude reminder of where these supplies and raw products come from is going to have to happen to a lot of these markets and a lot of the, these places. And it's not going to be pleasant. But as you said, we need to have this perspective of where these metals and minerals come from. Well, yeah. And of course, on the other, on the moral side of it, you know, there's been these documentaries on, you know, (laughs) these mines in the Congo and places, you know, that, Mm -hmm. you know, the cobalt mines that like, you know, using child labor, but, you know, the, the yuppie and liberal in Beverly Hills doesn't really care that, you know, what's going on to, some five-year-old kid in Africa, as long as he can get his Tesla, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that part of it as well. But you're right. People don't really understand that. And they take that for granted. Like, you know, I saw in the US when Trump, you know, lost his civil case, a lot of the truckers who are pro-Trump are talking about, you know, hey, we're not going to say, you know, you want to do that? Okay, we won't drive in, you know, the fruits and vegetables that you're saying are at those little shops in New York City, bodegas and stuff. And it's like, then they'll realize, oh, yeah, this stuff actually has to get here somehow. You know, it's not just like it magically appears <laughs> at a shop in the middle of a densely populated city. Like it's got to get there via truck, you know, which basically, by the way, is, is via diesel fuel, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And I think you're right. People just are kind of they just assume things in modern society are always going to show there. up mm-hmm. They show up. Like I know, like living on the island, a lot of the times it's and it's kind of like, I guess they say the the kind of what you have to deal with to live in paradise or everyone to call it <laughs> is a lot of on the like the last night I was telling yesterday my power went out for 10 hours we had a rainstorm in the morning mm-hmm. I knew it went out didn't come back to 10 I had to run off my you know I, I just didn't turn my generator on for a few hours but once it started getting dark in the evening I turned it on I live off my rainwater tank so sometimes in the dry season I got to buy water you know so you know when I run out and when you run out of water by the way it's a horrible experience mm-hmm. you know it's it's actually probably think worse than not having power. Yeah, I just you know you, you take for granted just flushing toilets, you know, turning on the sink, etc. So it's like so I'm actually cognizant living here. What I'm trying to say is where the stuff comes from. You know, I get I get power outages here. I can run out of water here. Most people are just used to oh that water comes out of the tap. Oh you know we're always going to have power and you know and then same thing if you're a real greenie. Well maybe that power is powered by coal or natural gas. You know, and if if you outlawed all those things, yeah, maybe you'd be blacked out half the day because there isn't enough capacity from solar or wind to power things. So, yeah, that's that's always an interesting thing I find right now with this whole green movement is I think these people are very ignorant 
to where these things actually come from. And again, longer term, I think that helps the commodity cycle. I think right now, though, it's more with the monetary side where if they do have to start monetizing debt, that's inflationary. We haven't seen any investment in these markets. So we don't have a huge amount of supply oversupply in a lot of these metals and minerals, et cetera, et cetera. And that can drive prices higher. And then at some point, that's going to signal investment into you know, the mining sector. And by the way, because I noticed that these generations of millennials and Gen Zers, they tend to like risky assets. You know, right now they're just doing their crypto tech thing. I think they'll actually be attracted to junior mining because that's a great it's about, point. Yeah, yeah. It's about the only market that's about as risky as those those other two and volatile as those other two uh, other two markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, again, if you take into account that younger people tend to be more liberal, they probably believe in the whole green thing. That could also spur their interest. If they, you know, they start reading articles. Oh, you need nickel. Oh, you need lithium. Oh, you know, you need cobalt. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting how these low rates have really driven everybody up the risk curve in search of a yield or a return. So once we have that rotation, like you say, that's an interesting place where there is a lot of risk and a lot of undervalued companies in that space. Yeah. And in terms of talking about the risk curve and the whatnot, I'd like to like say one more comment on that. I think one reason that you know, I showed the 10-year bond yield being below the two-year bond I think one reason we've never seen really the 10-year bond get above the Fed funds rate is because people were so used to getting zero rates, you know, really going back to 2009. Mm -hmm. Once that bond got up to three, four, five percent, they're like, oh man, yeah, that's great. I'll lock in on that, you know, because at least I'm getting four or five percent now. And I was getting zero for years. But I think that was kind of the sweet spot for that. Because again, as the debt continue goes higher, I think people are going to be like, well, and I'm talking more like big term time investors, not just small retail people. They're going to be like, okay, we had our little sweet spot where we were just happy to get four or five percent because we got zero for 15 years. But now we kind of need a little more of a premium because your financial situation, you know, it's like it all comes down to simplicity. It doesn't have to be complicated. Mm -hmm. If you know, it's like someone who has to get a subprime mortgage. What are they? They probably were, they probably don't have a huge amount of income. They probably have a bad credit record. They're higher risks. So the bank tells them. We won't give you a loan. So they have to go to a subprime lender and you have to get a 10% interest on their loan instead of five. Mm -hmm. Well, same thing goes with the government that, hey, your spending's out of control, your debt's out of control, and we don't think you're solvent or responsible. So you're going to have to give us 7% on that debt instead of you know four you know, a few years ago. Yeah, exactly. Excellent, David. Well, I think that's a good way to kind of wrap up for today. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we do? No, it's just, uh, if you again, you go to my website, you go to my YouTube page, it's YouTube at Scott Day, which is short form stock chart of the day. Mm -hmm. And and you can just see all the videos there. And I think people will enjoy my videos on that kind of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin disconnect or the Bitcoin connect with the bubbles, I mean. And then enjoy, like, you know, I, I talk about commodities being cheap recently, and I've done one on kind of that, this debt rollover that has to happen. So we've kind of talked about it in detail here, but, you know, those videos are just kind of focused each on one of those scenarios. So yeah, mm -hmm. just go look it up. And if you're always interested, I have a little Patreon page. It's just Patreon slash Doc Chart of the Day. I consider it to be like more of a donation than a subscription. It's only seven bucks a month. So like, if you like what you see, obviously making a little side income out of it always will help it keep going longer term. And that will actually, I have members updates too for Stock Chart of the Day and Patreon gives you where I talk about you know companies I like and trades I'm doing. So uh, you know that will give you access to that as well. Excellent. David, thanks so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks for having me. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.